All right, hello everyone, this is Jack Bar speaking, and welcome to another episode of the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about cash flow. We're going to talk about cash flow without banks. We're going to talk about, uh, about lease options, about seller financing, about, uh, about, yeah, all these different things, but not with land. Actually, I'm going to make an exception today and talk about houses. So, but we'll be right back. Welcome to the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Investing Podcast with your hosts, Jack and Michelle Bosch. Together, let's uncover the secrets to building true wealth through real estate and living a purpose-driven life. All right. Welcome, everyone, again. So first of all, I want to introduce our guest, uh, Chris. How are you, Chris? I'm excellent. Thanks, Jack. Wonderful. So thank you for, uh, for coming on the show. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very curious about what you do because uh, you're obviously, um, our audience knows us. We have been basically, I realize my microphone is far away from me here. There we go. Now it's closer. Um, my, uh, our audience knows that we have been kind of like um, speaking against houses a little bit. So because in houses you're dealing with tennis toilets, trash and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but you have a house method that allows you to actually go around a bunch of these things. Like, tell us about it. Yes. Yeah, so we buy everything on either lease purchase or owner financing as far as the, dealing with the sellers. And then to your last point, we sell everything on either rent to own or owner financing. Both of those taking me out of the landlord mode in almost every case. And I say almost every case because life happens to some people, right? And they have life events and they can mess up two, two to 5% of the time. But most of our, our buyers are buyers. They're not, they're not tenants. Oh, wonderful. So, so great. So, uh, so right out of the get-go, we're going to talk today about the method of house flipping that allows you to get houses from owners uh, on a subject to or lease option purchase. And then you turn around and you sell it with seller financing or with uh, lease purchase agreements. Mm -hmm. All of which we are fairly familiar with because, but we're going to jump with, uh, in, but the combination is really unique and the combination is really cool. So let's, let's jump into that a little bit more. So first of all, before we go into that, tell us, how did you come up with this? Like, give us, give us a little bit of your backstory. Yeah, mostly, well, I've been at real estate for, since 1991, so I'm dating myself slightly there, but um, I've done everything from building homes to uh, land development to commercial. What happened after the 08 uh, crash, though, is uh, I said, okay, man, I, we got beat up badly, and it was because we were on personally on all the loans of all the properties that just lost two, a third to two-thirds value. So around 2012 into 13, we said, let's re-engineer everything, and that was no bank loans, no cash. You know, no signing personally with banks. That's a major, major headache and a problem waiting to happen. And then we said, okay, let's do so on with the sellers on terms that are long enough where we don't care about um, market trends that are short, short term. Because everybody asks me that. Well, how's it going to work if the market changes? I'm okay because we have long, long terms on some of these. Okay. So you, you, you were hurt in the, in the crisis because you had personally signed on a bunch of loans that lost oh, yeah. a lot of value. Um, and then, uh, then you did the smart thing. Instead of leaving the industry like some people did, uh, you just looked at it as like, okay, how can I learn from that? And isn't that a key, isn't that a key measure that, that instead of like every, every, every loss or every, every failure you ever had, it can be a failure forever or it can be a, a learning opportunity to how to make things better. So you came up with this better strategy. Now, explain that strategy to us. Um, so I can go on each one. I can go on each one. We want to do lease purchase first? Sure. Let's start with these purchase. How do you buy these things? Okay. So let's say, let's assume a couple things just for the example, because obviously there's many examples. Let's assume the home, your home, you're the seller, your home's worth around 300. Uh, it's 250 debt on it. And we're going to go ahead and go under agreement with you. We're going to say, look, Jack, we're going to guarantee you your 50,000 in equity if that's what we agreed on. We're going to guarantee it though at the end of the term, call it 36 months for the sake of this example. So during that time, what happens? Well, we're going to start making the mortgage payments on the underlying debt directly to the bank. Once we can, uh, firm up our tenant buyer, find our tenant buyer. That tenant buyer, by the way, needs what? Just they need time to either save more, fix their credit, whatever it might be. Uh, during that time period, they act, behave like, and pay for things like they're a buyer. So I'm not in land landlord mode. Then at the end of the term or before, once they've gone through their mortgage ready plan, that could be, again, in credit enhancement or building up down payment or just seasoning with the bank, then they're going to cash out with a conventional loan. When they do so, the seller gets their $50,000 in that example. 
we get what? We get any markup in the house that we did. We get any and all principal pay down that benefit and accrued over the term of the loan. Uh, meanwhile, we also got the upfront down payment and the monthly spread on the mortgage to the, to the, to the buyer rent payment. And I say that because I, there's a lot of, you're, you're in the biz, there's a lot of people that do one deal, get one check, wholesale, you know, rehabbers, et cetera. We do one deal, we create three different cash flow streams now, over time, and then at the end. All right. Um, that makes sense. Now, so uh, how, so to, to, sim to simplify this, I, I like to sometimes take, you went very quickly through a bunch of things like, so in other words, there's a seller that just, I don't want my house anymore. Uh, why doesn't the seller, uh, why doesn't listen that seller, well, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, but the seller doesn't want his house anymore. You come along and you basically take over his payments, right? So like, I'm going to take over the payment and the moment, and then you go market that property, find somebody else that wants that house. You put that person into the house with a sale agreement or with a, with a seller financing uh, kind of deal or lease purchase agreement. We'll cover those in a moment. Yep. We have a lease purchasing in our own program too. So, and, uh, and then because they can't qualify, for, usually qualify for a loan right away, but because they are going to buy that house, um, they are now performing as a buyer. In other words, if the air condition breaks, they go fix it. Correct. Yep. If the, if the heater breaks, they go fix it. If they, they need to do something to repairs, they go fix it. So you don't have to do those kind of things. So in other words, the seller is happy because the seller gets his mortgage paid and the buyer is happy because the buyer now gets his, um, the buyer gets, gets to live in a house already that he builds equity towards potentially already. Correct. Uh, and, uh, and then once his credit is better or he got the inheritance or whatever he's saying, yeah. uh, then he, he, he will go and then get a loan for that thing. So what is it? Uh, so, so now the, the obvious question that always somebody asks is like, why, why doesn't this, the market is up? The market is in, in many markets, the market is up. Um, why doesn't the seller just sell the property himself? Yeah, sometimes a number of different things and no priority order. Sometimes uh, it's functionality. It's the, the reason it's not selling because we remember where we fish for these, where we look for these, Jack, is expired listings and for sale by owners. So both of those, you know, that's, that's where we're finding our deals. So it could be price. It could be they want all their money. Uh, it could be they owe about what it's worth or if they paid a realtor, they'd go negative. Uh, you know, any one of these things. Uh, divorce, have to do something quickly leaving the state, have to do something quickly. All these have happened. And, and I don't want to make it sound like it's always a headache that we do these on free and clear properties too, where for personal reasons, estate planning reasons, price, we'll do uh, free and clear properties with sellers. And so that's someone that doesn't need the cash right away. This fits for anyone not needing cash right away, but <coughs> wants the best price. Okay. Because you, with this method, you are ultimately enabling, uh, be, you're in a position that you don't have to discount the price and get beat them down on the price. You can get them at a decent price. You're just then asking the other guy for a bit more, right? Yeah, exactly. And we're asking the seller for what in order to do the, the nice price? Time. We need time. The right. price is not as important as time on the term. Right. All right. That makes sense. So time, yeah. Time, time in this case is is the factor, which is a brilliant method, particularly in a market that currently is not accelerating that much anymore. So it's, um, when, you, when you're in a super accelerating market, you can buy something cheap, you don't need time, you just buy a deal and, and you sell it very quickly or if, you're in a, uh, or if you get a big discount. But in this case, you have a market of people that wanna get rid of their properties at a good price, you can provide that, great. So now you have a with lease option. Uh, now explain the subject to method to us. Sure. Subject two is um, typically is when someone's a little bit more stressed out, unlike the example I just gave, and they do need to move quickly for whatever reason. They could be in arrears. They just could be where they can't afford it anymore because of a life event. So we purchase a home. We actually, there's actually a transfer that takes place. The loan, however, stays in the seller's name, thus the word subject to existing financing. And so um, many examples of those we can go into, but that there's no set time frame on that. So we own it. We get all the benefits of ownership uh, right off wise and otherwise, but the loan's never in our name. So we control right now, for example, anywhere around 50 or 60 um, homes. None of those are we on a personal loan for us. So they, they're controlled in one of those methods that we just talked about and subject to is one of them. Right. Now, technically, my, it's my understanding the bank could call that loan due if they knew about it, but uh, has that ever happened to you? 
No, this is, there's, a, um, there's a couple things I have a comment for that. Of course they can. There's a due on sale clause if, if a deed is transferred, right? It's been my experience so far, and I've been at this 20, going on 29 years, that if you pay the bill, the bank's not in the real estate business of taking homes back. But uh, obviously, if you decide to do something sideways on that, you're going to get yourself in trouble. But we make sure they get paid on time. There's no issue. Right, exactly. And that's the thing. Banks are in the business of making money. As long as the loan gets paid, the loan gets paid. It's not different, in a sense, for the bank that if, you have a piece of you have a house that you're paying a mortgage off and you can make the payment and your parents make the payment for you or your uncle bob makes the payment for you in terms of like the bank is not going to reject that payment is my point the bank exactly some people care. think they would yeah yeah the bank is going to say like, okay somebody's paying for it i don't care <laughs> and right. uh, and then they'll continue accepting the payment so and and, and that that makes per perfect sense great so now that we establish how you buy these properties and, and obviously lease purchase and um uh, lease purchase or, or uh, owner financing on the buying side or uh, subject to our well-established methods out there. What I find really interesting is that what you ultimately do is what a lot of people do is on the selling side, they go rent the property and, uh, and just like make a spread on that end. But what you end up doing is you actually go and sell it with seller financing or a, do a lease purchase on the back end. Um, and that is, um, that is very cool. So now, how explain those two concepts to us? Sure. So let's go with the main one that we've done. Since, you know, I'm going on seven years now, and that is the the rent to own. So you said that on the back end. So that's the rent to own or lease purchase, but same thing. And what we look for though is very different than you hear a lot of trainers doing. So, and I I mean this. We make sure that the buyers are getting a mortgage ready plan. So in other words, we're not accepting them into the home. And until and unless we know that they can eventually qualify for it. And so if somebody came through just as a glorified renter, had no credit, no plan to get there, no down payment, then I get in the home because that's just a renter. What right. we make sure is they have three to 10% down, three might get them in the door. Over time, they're going to build that down payment up by making more down payments to us, which is nice for them to get them best in the home, but also for us for cash flow, obviously. Right. And then, so that's your payday number one. And while they're in the home, again, after they've been through the mortgage readiness plan and make sure they're okay, then they're going to go ahead and make a payment to us in the spread. The difference between what we're paying the bank and them is, is our payday too. Uh, and then towards the end, uh, on or before 36 months or whatever the plan was that the, that the mortgage ready company gave us, we're going to have that as their term with a little buffer probably so they can make sure they get to, get to the finish line. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. And, I, and actually I respect that and I like that, that you, that you are. Uh, not just adding people in for the sake of adding them in. There's, there's a lot of people in the industry, just to, for everyone to know, there's a lot of people in the industry. What they do is they, they do what you do on the front end. So they get the house, but then when they turn around, they just take anyone into their property as long as they have a, a down payment. Because here's the thing, when you do a lease purchase, you don't just, you're not necessarily restricted to only a, one month worth of rent uh, deposit that you have to give back. What they're doing is they're giving you a non-refundable deposit. Is that correct? Correct, hundred percent. Deposit can be substantially higher than the normal tenant does. So what the bad guys in the industry do, and I'm not, I'm more than happy to to not name names, but like, uh, but like tell the practice. So stay away from the practice. Everyone listening to this or watching this is they're getting just anyone in that has like a three, four, five thousand dollar down payment, right? And then they pay their monthly rent and they push back on the lease. Uh, if there's something breaks, they call them and they're like, no, they, you want to buy this thing, you're not going to do it. But they know very perfectly well that within two, three years, they're going to move out. They're going to not be able, they're never going to be able to buy that house. So at the end of the day, it turns into a tenant that then gets frustrated, that then leaves. And guess what they do? They collect the next big, big deposit now and do it again and again and again. And in essence, what they've created is a fancy rental property uh, or a fancy way to have a rental property with big deposits that they get to keep. I really don't endorse that. Don't condone that um, because um, at the end of the day, yeah, it's just like taking people's money and, and, and prying, prying on their hopes of being able to buy this property. But in reality, they really don't have a plan or a chance to do that. So yeah. I really respect what you do, that you, that you only take them once they go to this program. They have a pathway to get there. And so they are really on the way to, to the American dream, to home ownership. 
Yeah, so here's a great example, Jack, on a, a very positive note. So you have a lot of self-employed people that prior to 08, me included, could walk in a bank and get a self, uh, I mean, a stated income loan, right? That, that's what they did. So now the contractor goes in, they're used to that kind of purchase. They haven't purchased in 10 years. They walk in a bank and there are some products out there now, but they're like 8 and 9% for stated income. And, and maybe they'll come back, but they, so they need seasoning. They need time. They have good credit. They have a down payment. They're ready to buy. That's a perfect example of a great person for a rent to own. And to your earlier point, Maybe legally they get away with it, but morally and ethically, that stinks to, to go to sleep at night thinking, these, these guys are not going to buy this house ever. So that's always been our philosophy. And, and from a liability standpoint, I think they're skating on thin ice too because you know you, you, we document the underwriting process, the mortgage ready process, the debt to income, I mean, everything. You got to do it that way if you're going to do it right. And you're right. They are out there. They're publicly out there. They're on YouTube telling people how to do it that way. It's crazy. Right. So, so, glad. so I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you, have, you do this differently. This is one of the reasons you're here. Um, so, so great. So now, um, the, this is the lease purchase, but you also mentioned you do sell a financing on the back end. And obviously that's something we're extremely familiar with because most of our land is being sold for sell financing. So when do you choose sell a financing over lease purchase? Yeah. Two good question. Two different times. And this is more in the last couple of years, Jack. So we started getting a little smarter about longer terms, about more subject to, so we can control it long term or just simply longer terms than owner financing, like this building I'm in right now, our office building is a 20 year owner financing deal. So if we get something that's like 10 years out or more, so we own it subject to, or we own it outright, then we'll consider owner financing if the second criteria is if the deposit is 10% or more. I'm not gonna turn over a deed for less than 10%, they might as well be a rent to own client until they get there. Right. Oh, and you so can sandwich those too, by the way, or combine those because someone can build up with a lease purchase or rent owned vehicle until you get to 10% or 15% or whatever you decide. And then you could transfer that into an owner financing at that time. That's a nice little combo. So in other words, if they're buying a $200,000 house from you, you want at the very minimum for them to either have a down payment of $20,000 or build $20,000 in equity through the, to the, to the rent to own program. And just as a reminder, before you allow them to do it, turn it into a seller financing deal. Yeah. Uh, just to, for everyone to know, uh, can, you, can you describe the process of a rent to own thing on a, on a monthly basis? They pay you a sum of money. What happens with that sum of money on a monthly basis? So we pay the uh, underlying debt. It could be the seller or the bank. And then the difference, and we average like anywhere from a low of $50 to a high of 1000 but our, our average is like 300 here, uh, not counting all the students. And so we keep the, that difference, the spread. So you give the difference, but if somebody pays you as a rent to own, let's say $1,500 a month, mm -hmm. um, what portion of that typically goes towards the purchase price or towards- Zero. The, yeah, zero. no, they don't get for lease because we tell them, look, some, some ask, like one out of 20 will ask, they'll, they'll think that's how the program works. We say, look, if we did that, why would you ever go get your own loan if we're giving you a higher credit than you could get uh, you know, with an amortized loan? So no, we don't credit any of it. However, we do have a cool program called the Down Payment Assistance Program that puts incentive on them to put more down above and beyond what was already agreed, that three to 10%. So if they want to go above and beyond that, they, they can go up to $500 in one calendar month. And you'll see why we have to cap it in a minute. They can go up to $500 in one calendar month and we'll credit them that 500 on their deposit, of course, but we'll give them a 50% reduction in price on that. So they'll get a $250 reduction in price at the end when they close. It incentivizes them putting more down. It helps them get stronger for the bank. And of course, it's good cash flow for us and, and gets them more invested in the home. Okay, I see that. So, okay, so, so once uh, you work with deposits more than with, uh, with a rent credit on a monthly basis. Correct. So, okay, that makes sense. So it's a rent to own, but they give you, let's say, a 3% uh, deposit right there, $6,000 at the beginning on a $200,000 house, let's just say. And then they pay a thousand dollars a month, and that is basically rent in this case. Correct. That piece and, is just the rent. And how would they go up to twenty thousand dollars by occasionally spend, spend, by occasionally doing extra an extra five hundred dollars, an extra thousand dollars in deposit towards the purchase price? Yeah, because that mortgage ready plan, remember, is going to say, well, this buyer or this couple should have X down by the end of, you know, to get financing, and usually that's closer to ten percent. So what we'll do is we'll structure tax refunds in the U.S. anyway. Tax refunds, uh, so February, March-ish, uh, we have a lot of deposits coming in. We might have uh, retroactive raises or people know they get quarterly bonuses. We'll sit with them and work that out and then they'll do that over time. Okay, that's very interesting. That's cool. I like that. I mean, that's, uh, that's and, and, and again, 
you're doing this the right way. This, of course, could be used predatorily by others, but uh, you're doing this the right way that you put him on a path that you know you got to get your credit to that, you got to get your deposit to that, you need a 10% down payment in order to qualify for whatever kind of like bank loan. So let's get you there. And exactly. as, as they make extra payments, get bonuses, get tax refunds, uh, you arrange for those to be sent to you so that you can so that you pay down the balance. Now, do you recalibrate their, their monthly payments based on that at some point of time or no? No, the only time, but that's a good question because the only time we do recalibrate, so to speak, is if the taxes go up. You know, let's say it's being escrowed in our underlying payment, which is a lot of them. If they creep up, we'll eat that first month. Let's say it's $18 or some proration. We'll eat that and we'll send them a letter and say next month your payment goes up by 18 or whatever it is. Right, right, right. And um, that's what the banks do anyway with us. Exactly. Right? So it gets them used to it too. You get a deal saying like either you pay from now on 50 bucks more or 500 bucks or whatever it is, or you pay us extra into a, uh, extra into the escrow account so that we have covered that for the next year. I exactly. usually use the extra so that I keep my payment the same. Yeah. Any loans that I have on like on, on, on rental properties or so. Very nice. Uh, very good. Cool. Now you have written a book about that, right? Yeah, we have two. The one that's the basic kind of foundation is called Real Estate on Your Terms. It's a bestseller. Uh, it's a hard copy book. And I had said to you before the show, I'm happy to give a link and that will get them a hard copy of the book. And it includes shipping. I can't stand when you, you know, you say oh, you go online and someone says, get my free book and it, you got to put a credit card in for eight or ten dollars for shipping. So we'll ship it out for free. The, the link is free, srecbook.com. So free, S-R-E-C, stands for Smart Real Estate Coach, uh, book.com. Okay, uh, free, S-R-E-C book.com. All right, that sounds good. You bet. Well, thank you very much. Now, what parts, is there any parts that we have not covered about what you do? Um, well, I, I mentioned earlier, I don't want to make it sound like all these deals are rosy, right? We do, our average three paydays is $75,000 a deal. But, but let me say what I, I mentioned in passing earlier, and that is you are going to have people that have life events. That's just part of real estate. And so let's say out of 50 deals, you're going to have two, three, four in a year that have a headache. They get a divorce. They, there's a death. They have a job loss, you know, and so they, they're probably going to have to move on. But for the most part, the, the other people will stick to the, those programs. <coughs> Very nice. And then um, what, 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 what ways we talked about you, you're dealing with uh, the for sale by owners and the expired listings, but then on the selling side, what methods do you use to find your, find your buyers? Yeah, two things. When you're brand new, you'll advertise your very first property and you'll get hit because you're offering terms. You'll get hit pretty heavy with uh, interest. A lot of them are going to be renters and you're going to weed through and get to the tenant buyers, the true tenant buyers. And so then you build your own list. Um, the, the easiest part of the process is the demand for the rent to own, believe it or not. So it's just getting that property and then it, it'll fill. It's just a matter of uh, the, the activity and the time. Uh, it's all online to answer your question. So there's probably 23 different portals that, that it hits if you do things like rent links and Craigslist and things like that. Okay, very good. Well, nice. That was great. So that was uh, interesting. Again, it's all about cash flow, guys. It's another example how uh, you can uh, create cash flow in different creative ways, whether with houses or without houses. Um, in this case, it was a method that works with houses that you can operate without banks. So I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this, I'm liking this. I'm still not touching houses personally, but uh, we're, we're doing apartment conferences instead uh, in, in addition to our land. But, um, but thank you very much. This is really, this is really good. So I have, I have a couple of last questions and that is sure. like, one of them is like, for example, it's kind of a rapid fire kind of question thing is like, what is your favorite book that you have been reading, that you've been lately reading? Um, the hard things about the hard things, uh, was recently, I just finished that. That was a cool one because it's kind of my style, like blunt, you know, right to the point, no fluff, just here's, here's what happens or here's what can happen in business in general. And then I love the, um, this is for anyone, not just real estate, but I love the, uh, Ray Kroc story, you know, behind the gold notches, the, the one they did a movie on because yeah. forget the, forget the McDonald's story, the fact that how he built it and the struggles he went through and all the trials and tribulations, that was pretty cool to see and how he scaled it. Okay, wonderful. Yes, so business scaling books are uh, some of my favorites. Yeah, uh, some of my favorite books too. Then, um, what is your what is your biggest failure that you had in, in life? Two thousand eight, by, by far. Uh, Two thousand eight was a complete nightmare. I talk about it in a full chapter in the book, so they can learn, they can learn from it um, with the with the debacle. I mean, I know a lot of people went through it, but but we went through it pretty hard too. 
Okay. Right. And then, um, and then another question is like, what would you, if you like, if you, if you're, if somebody's listening here and looks at all different, doesn't really know what to do, but wants to get started in real estate, what would you tell that person? Uh, simple. I, I would, there's so many niches and then there's niches within niches. So I would jump on as many uh, YouTube and podcast things that you can delve into. And so find out what gets you going, find out if it's land, find out if it's houses or find out if it's building, well, find out what niche you're going to get excited about. Then once you do that, find someone in that niche that is working and kind of heading in the same direction where you want to go, but still currently working in the trenches, not did it 20 years ago. And then third, once you find that, that niche and that person, then don't deviate for three years. Don't get thrown off by shiny objects and try to look at another niche. Just three years, blinders on. And if you do that with the right mentor or group or community, you'll have a phenomenal experience. And, and that goes for any business, not just real estate. Right. Absolutely agree. Couldn't agree more. Um, once we call it get in line, stay in line, because uh, it's like it's it's it's. If you can't do 15 things half ass. You got to you got to do one thing right. And, and the key to that is spend the time up front figuring out there's nothing wrong with dabbling in 18 different things until you figure out which is the one that you want to do truly do. Right. But don't spend a year on each. Spend like just learn enough that you know, is that really juicing me? Is that get me going, as you said? Yeah. And once you have that one that gets you going, blinders on and keep going. That's what we have done. That's what you have obviously done. So with that, thank you very much. Um, so I, I, I love that. Again, if you want to give the website one more time where they can get a free book, uh, go ahead. Sure. They can head over to free, F-R-E-E, -E, then the letters S-R-E-C book.com, free S-R-E-C book.com. Wonderful. And with that, we will conclude our podcast episode. Again, this is Jack Bosch. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, give us a five-star review. Give us a thumbs up if you're watching this on YouTube or somewhere else. If you're listening to it on a podcast platform, give us a review and share it with your friends so we can reach more people with this message about cash flow in real estate. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Enjoyed this episode? Then make sure you like, subscribe, and post your comments and questions below the video. We're looking forward to hearing from you.